Well, good afternoon, all. Cynthia Tomain here with Interactive Brokers. And thanks for joining us this afternoon for the Tim Morge presentation on three-dimensional trading with lines of slope and or force and slope. Now, before we actually do get started here this afternoon, um, I want to bring in our sponsor, the CME Group. Um, CME is uh, – responsible for bringing you Tim's, uh, Tim for today's presentation. So, Pete, if you can unmute your phone, we'll go ahead. I've got the slides, uh, your slides up, and oh, here's okay. the ball. let's get started. Good morning, Cynthia. Good morning, Tim, and good morning to everyone out there at IB, all their traders. Uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone around the globe for joining us today. CME Group is so pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with IB and extend a warm welcome to you for t uh, today's presentation, Three-Dimensional Trading, Lines of Slope and Force with Tim Morris. CME Group and IB have been working together to bring you professional educational webinars on futures for many years. We encourage you to look into IB's webinar archives for past events from 2013, 2014, as well as register to attend further monthly events. Uh, just a brief look at our disclaimer. Uh, got to give you guys a minute. I'm sure you see more more of these than you care to count. But again, futures are a leverage product, and there is risk of loss. So give me just a second on this. As a trader and investor, you look for opportunity in the markets and ways to capture that opportunity. Futures are an extremely flexible tool for expressing your market opinion and capturing trading opportunity. The CME Group Futures and Futures Options Markets trade electronically almost 24 hours a day, providing traders an opportunity to trade market volatility any time of the day from anywhere in the world. CME Group represents a family of individual exchanges, including the CBOT, the CME, NYMEX, COMEX, and Kansas City Board of Trade Exchanges, with contracts covering all major asset classes, including FX, stock indexes, agricultural commodities, energy, metals, and interest rates. CME Group is regulated by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, if you guys get a chance, we strongly urge you to take a look at the Interactive Brokers CME Group Futures Resource Center. It can be found at www.interactivebrokers.com backslash CME. Start your day with quotes, news, charts, and really succinct and valuable product information on the most actively traded futures markets. And just to give you guys a heads up, September 25th, we're going to be uh, continuing our School of Futures presentation with an introduction to CME's uh, metals markets and metal futures. So uh, uh, myself, along with Dan Gramsell, will be presenting that on September 15th. So if you wanted to learn about trading uh, metals, uh, gold, silver, and copper, platinum, and palladium, and some of their relationships, please come and join us for a, a really interesting and dynamic discussion of those markets. So Tim Morris has been a professional trader, author, educator, and mentor for more than 35 years. Besides trading his own capital, Tim is president of Black Farm Capital, a private money management firm that works with several of the largest non-U.S. institutional portfolios. In the 80s and 90s, he managed and taught other traders for institutions like Commodities Corp., J.P. Morgan, and Goldman Sachs. He remains one of the world's largest currency traders, routinely carrying positions of several billion U.S. dollars. Tim has taught hundreds of professional floor traders at the uh, Board of Trade and at the Merck to become successful off-floor electronic traders. He is a regular lecturer at some of the most prestigious graduate schools of business and finance in the United States, including MIT, Stanford, and the University of Chicago. He currently donates his time teaching basic technical analysis to fourth and fifth grade accelerated students at 59 elementary schools around the United States. The program is named Pray on Drive. He is a regular featured speaker at the popular Traders Expos held around the world, writes a weekly column for MSN and MoneyShow.com, and gives ed educational webcasts for most of the exchanges around the world. He is the author of several highly regarded books, Trading with Media Lines, and Mapping the Markets, featuring his own trading methods. His website, www.marketgeometry.com, features a great deal of free information regarding his trading methodology and are visited by thousands of traders from around the world on a regular basis. As always, thanks for making your time and your schedule for us, Tim. Over to you. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Cynthia. Uh, it'll take me a minute to get used to this. I've got a little bit of an uh, echo in the background, but in WebEx, but we'll get it. Hopefully you all can hear me well. Cynthia, okay? 
I'm hearing you just fine. Um, right, I'm going to ask everyone if you could. Oh, okay. I'm getting those yeses back. I did turn off the chat panel, so you can't see it. But, uh, okay, yes, you. you sound okay. I'll try not to lose to myself. So we're doing uh, three-dimensional trading, lines of force and slope. Um, this is a, a very popular topic in our breakfast sessions, as well as our midday market map sessions. Our advanced students really uh, like these tools and have found them extremely helpful uh, to, to find entries right before the market turns. So let's not look at me anymore. Uh, this is our educational arm, market geometry, which is owned by Blackburn. And just like Pete, we, anytime we talk about anything financial, we've got to have a disclaimer. Um, I guess what I would point out here is, you can read the rest of this. If you came here looking for the Holy Grail, I don't have it. It doesn't exist. If I had it, I'd give it to you. Um, as close as I can come is to recommend the best education you can find, which I think you're getting a piece of here anytime you come to any of the IB webinars, anything the CME puts together, um, and hard work. Also, this is my experience and my students' experience. Um, yours may vary depending on your talent, how, how well you practice, and what's going on in the market. And last, as Pete said, these are futures. They are leveraged. You can lose more money than you want to lose if the markets uh, go into a fast-paced action. Please don't use too much leverage, um, e even though your broker may allow you to. Trade prudently. Trade when you want to. That's your edge. And enjoy it. So without any more disclaimers, let's go on and see if we can do something fun. So I'm going to dedicate this as I have for the last, I don't know, six months or so to all of you. Um, I'm really honored that you guys take time out of your busy schedule to come and hear me. Um, I'm going to present in the same style that I present at uh, MIT and Stanford. Just be patient while the material unfolds. I know you have questions. I'll answer any question you have at the end. But let the material just flow through, um, and it'll build. You may not even see where I'm going, but I really am going somewhere that makes sense. Um, at the university, this would probably be a three or four hour lecture. We're going to condense it a little bit, um, but all of it's still there. At the end, you'll get the slides as you leave, and you can go over them as well as watch the recording, um, and you'll be able to chase down any of your questions if I missed one. Again, your questions are going to be answered after the presentation. I'm, the pad channel is frozen because I'm not very good at um, paying attention just to my slides and not the chats. So um, if you're chatting to each other, please keep your comments related to this material because most people are here to learn this. And if you're here and you know what's coming on, just let me answer the questions and let everybody uh, focus on the slides instead of chat. So, all right. So I always start out with the uh, pardon me for Greek. Dead Creek comments. Um, they're, they're still the, the smartest group of people that ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. Let no one ignorant, ignorant of your geometry enter here. We're going to be using some geometry. Don't worry about your math skills. There's not going to be any tests. You don't need any high level geometry, but I'll lead you down that path. And we'll be using Plato as well as some other uh, Greek work. Uh, come on, there we go. We, if we don't understand motion, we can't understand nature. And that's from Aristotle, another extremely intelligent uh, Greek. So one thing that we know, and it's always true, it may be more, it may be less, a price always fluctuates. If price didn't fluctuate, we couldn't make money. So we're going to use that fluctuation, and a different way of looking at that fluctuation to try and help us enter the market uh, at more opportune moments. We don't want to chase price just because it's going up or because it's going down. We don't want to make impulse trades. 
We want to tactically think, wait for an opportunity, and if the market's doing what we think, then we want to place it limit orders with stops at that correct time and get, and get in where we want to get in so that we have good risk management, good risk reward, and the trade is all as we planned. Now, we can make all the plans we want. We can wait patiently for the opportunity. We can have our logic going, our logic going. We can have our geometry going. Can we be wrong? Sure. The best traders in the world, well, I'm one of them, um, over the lifetime of actually a little bit over 40 years now, I'm at about a 66% win percentage, which is a statistic I'm not that fond of, but I just want, that means at least a third of the time I'm wrong, period. So you should not expect to go to a few seminars, pay somebody $10,000, and then have an 80% winning rate. That's what people focus on. They think it's realistic. And they're told that. And I feel bad for you guys. It's not going to happen. You, if you use risk reward, can make plenty of money. If you're 40% profitable, 45% profitable, if you get to 50%, that's magnificent. Most hedge fund guys and girls are not above 50%. Can we be right? God, I hope so. Many of us are. Many of my students are. Um, I, I, I quit counting the number of traders that are professionals that I have mentored, but it's, it's, it's probably over the, in the tens of thousands at this point. So, when you're getting ready to trade, again, no impulse trading. Don't chase price. And when you're planning things out and you see an opportunity, slow down. When the market speeds up, slow down. It's one of the best things I can tell you. When the market speeds up, slow down. Measure twice, cut once. When it's time to trade, you have to to be decisive, you have to believe in your work, and you have to act with purpose. When it's time, trade. When it's not time, wait. That's your edge. You don't have to trade until it's time. But when it's time, act with purpose. Draw and think with precision. And always follow your trading plan. A bad trading plan is better than no trading plan at all. So we're going to look at the British pound against the dollar. And we're going to look at 20-minute bars. Um, at the end, I know I'm going to get this question, but um, most fund, manage, uh, fund managers in the world look at 240 minutes as their basic chart. Uh, it's changed from dailies to 240s. But if you're going to enter day or trade for only a, a couple of days, it, it's very nice if you can move down to about 20 minutes. If you're using, um, let's see, at a trader and some other things that don't allow you to get to 20s, just go to 15 or 30, whichever gives you a nice, smooth, flowing chart. But this technique will work on tick charts, Dailies, weeklies, monthlies, 20s, 240 minutes, whatever you're trying to do. Anything that fluctuates um, in any time or space frame. So here we go. Let me see if I got my, yeah, I do. Oh, cool. Very cool. All right. So we are at the moment, you can see we had a, I lost my cursor. There we go. Um, we had a nice top of the range, a nice bottom of the range, and then we have what we call range extension. People were selling at the top of the range, and it made a run down, quite happy, ran into some buyers down on this level, and you can see the close on this bar at a time, and the rats start to leave the ship. 
and one person decides to get out of their position, and another person, and another person, and another person, or a large trader like me decides to run stops. And that's what this is. It causes range extension. All the stops get run. When everybody's bought, and there's literally maybe just one contract left to sell, and there's nobody to buy it, the market actually turns. And so price fluctuates. And look where we go. We fall all the way back down to the prior low that caused this run up and stopped. And closed near our high. Then we went back and traversed what was the range originally and kept going and right, went, went right to the top of where we washed everyone out. We got a bar, we poked out and took a look at what was up here. What happened was price opened the door, everybody ran in, and what did they found? They found large sellers. This is trademark of a whale. Somebody's got some good orders, good sized orders, sitting there, and they're willing to sell. So people come in, they open the door, and they see lions and tigers and bears, and they run right back down the hall. And where do we go? This is the important part. We pull back, but we don't pull back to these double bottom lows. Instead, we pull back to a higher low and establish a new range and slowly start to crawl higher. But the key is this is a higher low. So we've got the bottom of the prior range. We've got double bottoms, which are higher lows. So we make a new high, and we pull back to a second higher low. I notice that I connected this first higher low and this second higher low. And we're still in a range. Don't get me wrong. We're still in a range. But let's connect this low and this low. And let's just move it forward. Project it forward. And this is called, I'll, I'll show you the difference. If this was a trending market, we would just draw a line through the middle. Not, not precisely. That's called a line of force. It's a vector. It gives us some sense of direction and some sense, because there's a slope, which we're going to talk about now, of its acceleration, deceleration, how fast it's going, however you want to manage it. We're going to do the same with this, but this is connecting this low, this low, projecting it forward, and this projects forward the acceleration of this market. Now, later on, we're going to be able to draw other lines that are sloped, and we can measure their velocity and tell whether or not the market is speeding up or speeding down while they're still in the range. It's a tremendous edge once you start to understand it. It's not the holy grail. It's not the one piece you need, but it's a piece of the bubble, bubble oh boy, puzzle that most of the market doesn't have. So it can give you the edge to make you the trader that's three, four, five steps ahead of the market. All right. So I connected this low. I connected this low. I projected it forward. And you can see price ran and tried to make it to the top of the new range and ran into sellers. Remember, when they got here, there were all kinds of sellers. And somebody has moved down. Somebody didn't get enough off. So they've moved down. So when it stops with a lower high, that's higher low, uh, run up and pull back down to a higher low. Okay. And then we 
come up and have a lower high, you connect the line, project it forward. Now we've got two things going on. We've got a look at the bottom and a look at the top. Obviously, this situation cannot exist. They're going to run into each other, so one of them is going to work. Is it time to trade? We're still in the rain. And we have conflicting reads on the speed of this market. So we watch. Price boxing a session, section. And you can see with the lower high here. Then we poke below the box. So I just connect this eye and this eye. Pull it forward, and you can see that this line, which is upsloping, has been broken. So now we're taking a look at the velocity of this first line to the second line. And you can see the price, because the slope is steeper, is speeding up to the downside. That, in and of itself, is not enough to trade. But if you have other reasons to think about a short, these are two key clues. So again, we're looking at this slope. We're looking at this projected slope. And we can really see that the slope of the connected tops is increasing or getting steeper. Now in a car, we can look at a speedometer to see how fast we're moving. In charting, we can get there the slope of consecutive lines. Just think about it. And we call these three-dimensional because they give us a third-order level of information. And you've all seen uh, Disney movies, uh, action movies that are in three dimensions. They're actually filmed very much the same, but they move one of the dimensions toward you. So, of course, um, the pirate jumps out of the screen right at you. He's really not there, but it gives you a greater sense of movement and motion, and that's what we're trying to do here. I have one student that has a 3D TV, which uses color to project um, a three-dimensional effect. And by changing, by being very careful about how he does color on these lines, he actually gets that similar three-dimensional effect. So I'll have to get a 3D screen. So now let's take a look. We've got our first line. We draw on our second line and project it forward, and we see that it's increasing. The speed continues to increase. Take a look. This is the line of force now, by the way. I haven't connected anything. Let me erase that again so you can see that. There you go. This is the line of force. The speed continues to increase. Price accelerates and heads near vertically lower, poking below the low of the bottom of the range. Now we poke below just as we did poking above over here. The question is, we come down here with great velocity or speed, are we going to run into major orders and end up right back into this range? I mean, we did close up here. Or are we going to continue lower? The key may be this line and this line and their relationship. Let's take a look. As I connect each of the drops and pullbacks, take a look. Drop and pull back, drop and pull back, drop and pull back. You should be able to feel the acceleration increasing, even though price is still right inside this range. We haven't gone anywhere. Yet, if you look at this from a physics sense, if we pretend this is the pirate coming out of the feeder screen. He's moving faster and faster 
closer to you. See it? You can see it accelerating. Look at it accelerating. But we're still in the range. Now, if you had a reason, some of your other methods, whether it's median lines, um, lines of frequency, anything else you use that gave you a quality short with good risk reward and a quality stop, these are very important additional pieces of information. Even though we're in a range and the rest of the market is looking at this saying, eh, it's not doing anything, it's in a range. We have new information ahead of the market. And sure enough, as it approaches the low, price accelerates. It runs through the range. Rather than pausing, price just ran through the bottom of the range. There apparently were no prior buyers. Did the rest of the market know anything? No. But we knew the acceleration of these lines were increasing, meaning the speed is getting faster, 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 and faster as we approach the low. Rather than pausing, price zooms through the low. This is known as, of course, range extension. We had a bit over here, but we have quite a bit more over here. Now, once again, we made a low, but we close near our high. So our question is, what is the quality of this bottom or this low? Price spent a great deal of energy to go vertical. Anytime price goes vertical, you have to stop and decide, is this sustainable? You might think about a paint, a pullback to the bottom of what was the range. Or this may be the, pull, the pullback to sell. Depends on your methods, technologies, what opportunities you see. But you have information that the rest of the market doesn't have. So let's watch. We already talked about each of these lines as a steeper slope as price unfolds. We've now broken out of the range. So price stalls down here. Is this a significant bottom or just a pause? And you can see our first down, first bar down, we closed here. And we've got a number of closes there. What do we get? Well, we have a number of bar closes here. And after making the run lower, we leave double bottoms, which are higher lows. And then we have a wide range bar. Same bottom. So now we've got triple bottoms. And it zooms through the market. This entire tiny range or box. It zooms right through it, closes above it, and that close from its low to its close has what we call great separation. In the currencies, separation, we need three to five ticks, and here we've got quite a bit more. So it's tremendous separation. One question remaining, we're at the bottom of the range. But after consolidating, a wide range bar forms higher with a close near its high. Price left, triple bottoms, above the low of the sell-off. So I connect the lowest low of the, let me dump this, sorry. I connect the lowest low to the higher bottom of the wide range bar right here. So I connect this. And I'm going to form an upsloping line of maximum excursion. So I'm going to measure the price slope. So give me the speed of the acceleration. So we've got horizontal, which is zero. And now we've got to move up, which is faster than zero. I don't need a numerical number. 
I can just compare the two slopes. So what happens? Price moves higher with three very strong bars, each closing near their high. Let's take a look. So we have this bar with its close, this bar with its close, and this bar. Come with me. There we go. With its close. Now we pull back a bit. It forms triple bottoms well above the low of the prior move lower. So what we want to know is, will this higher low tell us more about the top or the bottom? Now we can put in a minor slope line if we want. And if we pull back further, we might be able to see that price is slowing down. Right now, we know that, and I haven't drawn this in, but we can. Price is accelerating and has accelerated more. So again, if you were looking for a long, you might use the fact that price is accelerating. If you could afford to stop, if you had, for example, a median line, from, let me erase. There we go. Maybe you're using a pen that works. Let me get my pen again. There we go. This low, this high, and this low, and draw a medium line. Or, Maybe you have another method, or maybe you're not ready to trade, but you have information that the rest of the market doesn't have. So let's see what this leads to. All right. Price continues higher. It makes a series of higher highs and higher lows, and I mark in the second line a maximum excursion, which I shorthand LME on the higher bottoms, and I project a line of maximum excursion off of the higher highs. So, I know this speed, and by connecting the current pullback, I've got this speed, and you can see there's quite a bit of difference between the two. It tells me price is accelerating nicely. Now, I want to know, this is two things. This is a, a vector. So it also carries slopes. I want to know how fast are the tops accelerating. So I'm looking at the bottom and the tops. And if we get another series that makes sense up here on the tops, I might connect those as well to see if we are continuing to make new highs on a slope basis or what we say 3D or if we, even though we're making horizontal new highs, we're making sloped, I'll draw this in, even though it hasn't happened yet, and it may not happen. Let's say we're making 2D highs, but they're lower. That would tell me the price is accelerating, but on the top, it's slowing down. It's having more and more difficulty making higher highs less efficient. And again, I ask the question, will a higher low here tell me more about the top or the bottom? It's a question you can think about. What do we get? Very simple. Horizontal is flat. This is our first look where we can measure speed and prices accelerate. We connect the next set of lines, and we can see price is accelerating even faster. Then we come up, and again, there's our pullback, there's our curl and our pullback, and we can connect that and project it forward, and price is accelerating faster. So it's speeding up even more. And then we 
curl again. So we can use this low again, and then this bottom of the curl. So we come up and pull back, connect it, and you can see again, look at price accelerating even more. Measuring the tops, I haven't drawn it in here, but I will. Here's the speed of the tops. You can see that the speed is increasing. So at the moment, it's not having any trouble making new two-dimensional or horizontal sides. Obviously, the buyers are in control here. There aren't any great sellers. If you remember earlier on, we had a great deal of sellers over here. We had no trouble with them. They haven't even showed up again. So it's important. We, we have a way to look and measure that, not just on horizontal highs, but also if it's speeding up both on the bottom and at the top. And most of the market doesn't have this information. So this can really help us when we're evaluating opportunities. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got all these nice lines that tell us that speed is accelerating. But remember, uh, it's my mom's thing, trees don't go to the sky. Price has spent a great deal of energy taking out all the, all the sellers, making new highs, a series of new highs, pullbacks, a new highs, pullbacks, these curls. And at some point, it does, we call this price moving without time. In other words, we're going relatively vertical. So this is the time axis. We made a lot of progress on the time axis, and we haven't moved very far to the right. Generally, that means that we have to catch up. Things have to be in balance. That's the way of the world. You go from extreme to balance. So let's see what I wrote. After expending a great deal of energy moving steeper, higher highs, and higher lows, price must pause and allow time to come back into balance by trading in a range. Again, another dead peak. As above, so a low. From extreme to balance to extreme. And for those of you that come here regularly, um, second Thursday of every month, of course you know that's from the Emerald Tablet, and Sir Isaac Newton, my favorite physicist, the last cause and effect physicist. And also, remember, probably half of you here took the alchemist pledge, uh, probably the last great alchemist um, in the world. He did a translation of the Emerald Tablet, and then he wrote his three laws of motion. And that's what we're using here. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest. Matter cannot be destroyed, created, things like that. You know, as you go over these slides, as you watch the recording again, you can think about those simple concepts and how they would relate to measuring, because all this comes directly from Newton's work. So, you make a range. Once price breaks out of the range to the downside, I pick this high as a potential alternating pivot. Whenever I draw a medium line, I need alternating pivots. I need a high, a low, and a high. That's just 20 minute bars. Or a low, a high, and a low. So when I see something that I consider interesting, I just put a dot above it to remind myself this may end up being an alternating pivot. So we've broken out of the range after expending a lot of energy. And you can see if I connected the tops, we're rolling over, at least in terms of tops. 
And finally, if you use this line that we originally used for velocity, if you use it instead for a line of frequency, or even just a simple slope trend line, the range is broken below everything, and the tops never get a chance here. So these are the first lines of maximum extrusion from the bottom, blue connecting the tops, brown connecting the bottoms. You can see they're coming together here. Price is clearly broken out of the range to the downside. And we like to think about price. We've talked about this in the seminars here before. Where are we in this cycle? And you can measure a tangent. And you can see that's when price is accelerating, accelerating less, accelerating less. And at some point, it does go horizontal. And then it will slowly have a negative slope, and then a greater negative slope. And it looks like if I do this, well, here you go. This looks like uh, me or Dan Gramsa. No, it'd have to be him. I don't have this much hair. But you got the idea. And high grade. I did. Okay. Has price goes on and on? That's what we want to know. Does the range break to the downside give me that tell where price is headed? Or is it simple consolidation? So let's look. I connect each of the drops and pullbacks. Even though price is making lower lows and lower highs, look carefully at the three lines of maximum excursion. So watch. And there's one. See a pullback and curl. Pull back and curl. There's two. Pull back and curl. And there's three. Now take a look. You can see. Let me erase all of this. The lines speak for themselves. Now you see what I'm doing. You can see. Just by looking at the lines over these pullbacks. We're going lower in a two-dimensional sense. But we're not accelerating. We're actually speeding up. We're still in a range. But this is not accelerating to the downside. It looks like it is. But when we actually measure it, and again, 99.999% of the market has no idea what we're talking about. If you take your time, this is not difficult concept. Even though we're in a range, you have some clues that the rest of the market doesn't have. This gives you a great tactical advantage. The market looks like it's making lower lows, lower highs, or some people are just going to be lazy and say, this isn't a range, I don't care. Some people are going to make a decision purely based on the range. But you have a set of information that the rest of the market doesn't have. Has price gone horizontal? Does the range break to the downside? Give me a tell where price is headed, for example, since it broke to the downside of my range. Is it going to make new lows? One piece of information might be these lines of force, lines of maximum excursion, are actually going faster and faster and faster. So what did I write? I connect each of the drops and pullbacks. Even though price is making lower lows and lower highs, look carefully at the three lines of maximum excursion. Price is decelerating or slowing down. I'm considering going short, but because price is decelerating, I'm not willing to enter an aggressive limit sell order because I expect price may pull back near the top of the range. I call that the last photon being Fired. If you're a uh, Star Trek fan, the photon tor torpedoes, and if they always, like, think they're out, 
And then Scotty finds the one. Oh, I've got another one, Captain. So this is like the last photon tor torpedo being fired. And I'm not willing to sell down here because there might be another photon torpedo coming to get it up somewhere up in here. And the difference between being short down here and being short up here is price location. It completely alters my stop tolerance. I never trade without stops, never enter anything without a stop at the same time. But if I'm entering down here, I probably can't afford to have my stop above the highs. If I'm entering up here, and I still think it's a good place to get short, my stops are significantly above prior highs. So this is information that you have that the rest of the market doesn't have. And you have to make your own tactical decision. You may decide that this will never see any higher highs, and this doesn't work for you, so you're going to go short right here. That's your decision. But I've just given you a new set of input when you're evaluating, evaluating your trade plan before you trade. There we go. So, remember what we were thinking about. I had marked one alternating pivot. Price had pulled down. We were right in this area. And we were looking at the lines of force. And they were not accelerating to the downside. So, I paused and I thought, there might be one last photon here. I might want to be patient. Excuse me. Now take a look what that input into my tactical thinking allowed me to do. Rather than try and go short around here at the highs, I'm anticipating, because this is accelerating, that it might have more upside than I think, so I stand out of the way. Let me see what I wrote. Is this a new trend to the upside? Well, let's get to the bottom. At spiking higher and consolidating, one bar moves from the new highs down to break. Well, I'm going to do it myself. Never mind. So we come up and make new highs. I'm glad I'm not short. I would have got stopped out. If I by the end of the short here, I'd be stopped out. I watch. Price makes a high. No follow through at all. This, you've seen these in the past webinars. When price makes a major high or low and doesn't follow through, I immediately put out a red for a high, a blue for a low as an advanced multi-pivot line. And these tell me in advance where structure is likely to form. So I put out my advanced multi-pivot line, and then I watch. And price doesn't approach it. This is called 2D or horizontal. Price does not approach it. And then... It begins to sell off. And then we get a huge bar lower. That not only sells off from these tops, but in one bar we go from these right at these tops to bust the low. But we do close near the middle. Okay. Take a look where we are. This, to me, this area, I'm not going to type advanced pivot line right here. We're going to this low because we didn't close on it. We closed near the half. I'm going to put out a line off of this low, advanced multi-pivot line, and it's going to mark out market structure for me. So now we're in this area, and this area is what I anticipated because we are making higher, or I should, I should say, our lines of maximum excursion. You should get speak well. Lines of maximum excursion are moving faster and faster and faster, even though we were making new horizontal or two dimensional lows. I held off selling, thinking we might get one run higher here, and if there's weaker afterwards, 
that would be a better place to sell. Now, that comes from my early education from really one of the most, most yeah, probably the, the best trader in terms of long-term trading in the last 300 years. And I've, tra I've investigated every trader, major trader that I could find over those 300 years. And Amos Hostetter, who was one of the co-founders of Commodities Corporation, I spent the last four years of his life, I, I spent as a young teenager going to Princeton and uh, spending time in his house and his training room. And what he taught us, and this is very important, don't try and pick a high. Wait for a high and wait for a reaction. So here's my high. Here's my reaction, which confirms this high. Then try and sell either a shoulder, which would be a lower high, or a weaker reaction, which would be even a lower high. Much better than trying to pick a top. Oh, you might have a better price here. But you're going to know so much more. You'll have confirmed that your idea that this is a top is probably right. Could you still be wrong? Just as I said at the beginning, of course you could. So once we come and make this wide range bar lower and break the bottom down here, I know 99% of you at that moment are making the low. Think, oh, God, it's never coming back. I've missed the trade. I did all this work. I watched this idiot's webinar. I paid attention to the lines, and they were going faster. And I had my chance to sell, but I waited because he told me to. And now it's all the way down here, and I'll never get my chance. The truth is about 80% of the time, you get back up in this area. You may not get the high, high, but you get somewhere back in this area. In fact, I think this is volatile enough to let me show you where I put my orders. I went just five pips underneath the prior high. My I use this as a visual if you haven't been here before. I go to go bar. It's 20 pips long. That's what that's the stop I'm using in the pound today. I hang it five pips below and project the rest forward. So he probably runs up to about here. And then I can visually say, okay, so do I think you can get this high? Yeah, I've got a number of tops up here. But if it gets this high, I think we'll see a flurry of sellers step in because this bar tells me that there were fresh, new, eager sellers. Can I miss the trade? Absolutely. But remember, missing the trade is just an opportunity loss. It's not P&L or profit and loss. Better to miss an opportunity than take a crappy entry to get stopped out. So be tactical. I thought here that the lines of force would give me one last photon tor torpedo high. It did. This line makes everybody nervous. My partner Shane Blankenship calls this the scary job. It's okay. What did I say earlier? When the market speeds up, slow down. What is your plan? The original plan should have been, if you're following me, Wait for the four photon torpedo to get it up to this area. Then it's really nice if you get this confirmation. That's an unusual sale bar, the size of it look at, compared to everything else. And we poured orders in here. You could be more aggressive. You could sell here if you want. You've got plenty of room. Look outside. Look at the size of your stop. So you could be more aggressive. I just think. This thing is wild and active, and probably is going to come back to retire, retouch the tops. I'm going to leave orders below the top, but I, I do expect a lower high. But I'm not going to be aggressive and try and sell out here. 
these wide range cars generally come back and be tested. So maybe maybe you put your order in here. Let's see what happens. All of our lines tell us the price is accelerating to the downside. I'm sorry. All of our lines tell us the price is accelerating to the upside, even as we make new horizontal lows. That keeps me from entering a short at a poor entry area. And you can see by the size of my Kona go bar, I would have been stopped out. Instead, I'm looking for a price to extend its energy with one last photon torpedo. It does, forms a range, falls out of bed. Most of the people are saying, oh, well, that's it. I've got to get short now. They're chasing. They're doing impulse trading. Instead, what am I going to do? I draw in a simple median line. I already had, this is my first alternating high. This is my, I get this drawn backwards. I draw in a median line. It's got a down sloping upper parallel. You'll have to re-low it, redraw it up a little bit. If you draw it, it looks just like this. And I want to sell, as it turns out, right at the upper peril. But that's also just along these, the tops of these highs. And you can see you have plenty of room. You can sell all the way down to here, maybe even lower. So, that's the third of my alternating pivots. You can see that the down move at the moment hasn't had much follow through. The key is whether or not we leave a higher or low. I'll try to keep leaving the top so you can find a cursor. Yeah, we don't have a cursor on WebEx exactly. All right, so that's what happens. Let me go back one more. So my order is I want I leave a limit sell order and I only use limit sell orders. Use limits and I put an initial stop loss order, twenty pips R. The size of the screen, go no go bar. And I use this just as a visual tool. Okay? Right here. So I put that Five pips below the high, projected 15 pips above. I put my sell limit order and my stop loss order together at the same time. Okay. And now I'm ready to see what the market's going to do. If you want to put in a limit profit order at, let's say, so we're using a stop of 20 pips. We want to be at least 3 to 1. So maybe you want to put a limit by order 75, 80, 100 pips lower, just in case it spikes lower and you get a gift. Nothing wrong with that. But I wouldn't do it less than 3 to 1, which would be 60 pips. That could be part of your original plan. And you can put in a contingency limit by order somewhere down here. Now remember, it's probably got to get past the lower parallel. So you have to have reason to think it's going to break through. Well, why would I think that? We've picked up a great deal of energy here by trading. Just turn your head a little bit to the right. And you can see this is a small range. So price has restored its energy. It comes up. And this looks like quite a failure to the downside. What I need now, if you're trying to get short, what you need is some sort of pullback. I want it to pull back all the way to this area. Maybe you're more aggressive than me. But somewhere in here, we need a pullback. I'd prefer it to be a lower high. Then I'd be trading with Amos's tenants, which are don't pick the high, wait for a reaction, sell a shoulder, or a weaker reaction, perhaps, over here. 
All right. Let's see what happens. Bryce, now I know it. Orient yourself. Take 30 seconds here and orient yourself. Because I know just by moving the market, moving the chart a little bit to the right, everything is completely scrunched in. So, this was our second alternating pivot. This is our third alternating pivot. And this was a huge wide range bar. Look, remember how big it looked? Look, it looked like price was not coming back into this area. And I left a limit sell order, 20 pips, which was five pips below the prior high, right here. And at the time, I guarantee you, most of you are never coming back. It always feels that way. Okay? But I want an opportunity. I don't need to change price, chase price. If it goes without me, that's okay. Now watch what happens. Price comes down, there's no follow through, and then huge spike tire. It's within, I don't know, three ticks, five ticks. Well, I'll answer questions afterwards, okay? From getting stopped out. But the, our, stop, our stops are related to the average true range and noise. I don't get stopped out. And look what price does. Price zooms to the downside. One huge wide range bar. As I look at this bar, one of the things that I tell people at Market Geometry in the breakfast sessions, which is our advanced classes, um, the market map session, Shane and I both teach there. We both mention this all the time. You know, if the trading gods give you a one-bar gift, take the damn money. Literally. And this one gave you five stops or a five-to-one risk-reward in one bar. And as an intraday trader, that's a big gift. You don't have to sit there and wait and get dragged by on the bus. You can take your five to one, go to lunch, go shopping, take your wife or your husband to lunch, enjoy the rest of the day. Spend 20 minutes having something to eat, clear your head, come back and trade tomorrow. But you can lock in your money. So as I see this bar and I watch the close, I lock in my profits. I take an 85 pip profit in one bar. Do I expect the might go lower? It might. But I've got a little bit over four to one in one bar. I'm not going to be a pig. And let's see what I wrote. I exit near the close of this wide range bar for two reasons. In one bar, my limit sell order gets filled. And I'm quickly making more than four times what I initially risked. The volatility has gotten quite violent. Price moved without time moving. Price moved without time moving. Look at price. Straight down. We haven't drifted to the right at all. So it's all price, no time. They have to be in balance. Price moved without time moving, which means the two are out of balance. Generally, they come back into balance by forming a long, protracted range, which we saw over here. I choose to lock in four times what I risked and then reassess market conditions and the probable path of price. Let me see what happens after this. So I take 85 pips out of the market. I check and make sure that I bold and so, bought and sold the same amount. Check my P&L, make sure it makes sense, make sure I didn't trade backwards. Happens. I'm out. Now I can actually get up, personally, I get up, 
leave my training room. It's about 30 yards outside the bicycle, outside of the mountain, into the house, get some tea, walk around. Let me say hi to my wife. After 10, 15 minutes, my head's clear. Come back into the training room. I also practice and teach that if Christ gives you a gift, take it. There are always more trades. This was a one-bar gift of 100 pips. I chose to take 85 pips. If you were faster, you might have taken 100. Tutorial, we're only halfway done. You'll learn more about it right here. And at the end, we'll tell you where you can learn more about this. Just be patient. All right, so let's see what happens. This is the wide range bar, and this is me saying thanks. Now, we did make more downside excursion. It's 1 a.m. in Singapore. Thank you for staying up, Victoria. I'll try and make it worth your time. So we do make lower lows and lower highs, and we do. There is money on the table. I have the easy money. It does go lower, but look how long it takes. And you can certainly could have snugged up a stop right here and then right here and been safe. But I chose to just take my money. In fact, I did something else. I don't, I probably taught. Um, I think this is probably, let's see, what time. this is, uh, Stanford. This is a Stanford class I'm teaching at the time. So, when I come back, I take a look. I go, wow, well, price step going lower. Here's my advanced multi-pivot line and my line of maximum excursion connected from this top, this top, projected forward. So, we're not going horizontal. We're still speeding up to the downside. But we spent all that energy in one bar. Price has got to go back in the balance. Let me read what I wrote. I guess this is the reason why I wrote it. Price ran over 100 pips without time. Price oh, uh, ran over 100 pips lower, which is price, without time moving. Price and time are now out of balance. So price and time must come back into balance. Now time is moving to the right with very little price movement. That's price coming back in the balance. Price did go further that after I took my profits. And if I'd stayed short, my short position would never have been in any danger. But you can see after a handful of bars, it became a very quiet range that eventually slipped a bit lower again. In truth, there was no market structure for me to hide a stop order behind. Once we got below here, you were basically just sitting with a stop right here, which is Really the same as the low of this bar. So other than hiding a 10 or 15 pip stop above here, there's no way to protect any of this. And now we're in just a very tiny range. Yes, we dropped, we doubled the range, right? And dropped here. So now what comes next? The three lines of maximum excursion are telling me mixed messages. Why do I say that? We made a straight drop. Let me erase some of this. Give me a second. Yeah, I'll make it obvious, I hope. Okay. Price is making new lows. Making lower lows and lower highs. Now, it's going horizontal. As it goes horizontal, when I connect the lines of maximum excursion, it looks like it's accelerating. So I'm not sure how the two to come together. Does that mean there's a new leg lower? Or does that mean the range will continue? Has price come back in the balance? I don't know. So I'm going to be patient. I've already got 85 tips on the day. Let's take a look. Here's what happened. Here's that big drop. Like the all things that fluctuate, the relationship between price and time move from balance 
to extreme and back to balance again. Excuse me. These fluctuations do not conform to any mathematical symmetry. Don't try and count bars. Don't try and measure. It's just not like that. Okay. We cannot use a calculation that will tell us how far time must travel to get back into balance with prior with price to price to time. Over the centuries, many people have tried to solve this equation, but honestly, they are tied together. But they're tied together too loosely. So things like squaring time and all that stuff doesn't work. Counting bars, no, not going to happen. Just think of it this way: you can feel the curl and the next curl. And now the next curl, but look at this one. We're going lower and faster, lower and even faster, lower and even faster, even faster. Now look at this curl. Now we're going higher. So we've got mixed messages. What's the quality of this bottom? And notice I put an alternating pivot up here, and I put one down here to say maybe this is a significant low. I don't know. So this is a high, a low. I need another high to use this for a median line. That's if it goes up. I've zoomed in. Go ahead and orient yourself. Pay attention, this is the alternating low, and this was our we had three or four lines of maximum excursion that were running down, and we had one moving up. Now let me pull back and show you the big picture. This is that low. These are the lines of maximum excursion pointing down. This one's pointing up. Now it's more Get it to the right, which rolls that off to the left. Orient yourself. We use OODA. Orient. Observe. Orient. Decision. Action. So orient yourself. These were the lines of exercise that were heading lower. This is the one that was heading higher. And now... We left one low, and then we're back in a range. Now, remember this about range. Ranges end when they decide to end. They don't end when you're tired. They don't end when I'm tired. That's for sure. They end when they end. So you have to watch, and you have to look for clues. I don't want to trade in a range, especially a range this small. So I have one thing going for me. I've got a low here that's below the range. The last line of maximum excursion that I could draw was upsloping. I don't really have anything else. These lows are relatively flat. And these highs are pretty flat. So I need more information. But I'm hoping pretty soon here, price and time are back in balance because of this range, and we'll get another set of clues that allow us to set up a trade plan looking for an opportunity. If you find opportunity, we'll exploit it. All right. So all the way the rest of the week, we were dragged along in this range. Nothing is going on. Here's the alternating low we use. There's a high sitting over there. This is Sunday night. This is Friday. This is Sunday night. Price opened all the way up there. Price closed on the first bar right there, leaving a nice large gap. This is a weekend gap. Now, Dr. Andrews taught us that each gap had two pivots, and either could be used as a high 
or a low pivot. So this could be a swing low or a swing high. This could be a swing high or a swing low. Or if you count the gap is moving from here, this could be the swing high, swing low. It's up to you. There's a bit of art here. Notice I put a different cover colored alternating pivot up here. I'm going to take a look at the quality of this eye. You can see that this bar opened on its eye and closed near its low. Sorry, opened on its eye, closed near its low. So I put a new alternating pivot right here. And let's see if that helps me as I try and sort out price action because we've gone from this big range to a spurt higher. We want to know what's going to happen with the gap. And we not want to know whether this high is significant or whether we're going to currently keep going higher. Let's see if I get, I don't know what the pencil tool is. So, oh, I'll get better. Okay. So, as we come up, here we are again. Here's our first. Now I've, I've scrunched in. I don't like to do that. It's too much data for me to trade with on my screen. But I need to show you where the alternating pivots are. On your charting, you'd know. This high, this low, and I'm waiting for price to do what we call a pendulum pullback and swing higher and leave a significant high. I don't know what the high is until it forms. Remember, I looked at this one. And we still have the low of the gap right here. And when we take out this side right here, I mark the low of the gap with a red dot. High, low. Take a look. It's on the same bar. Most people are not going to draw this way. But because of Andrews and what he taught me over the 17 years I studied with him, I know that I can use this as a swing high or a swing low. So I'm going to use the high where it opened and the low, which is the high of the gap, bottom of the gap, however you want to think of it, as two alternating pivots. Now I need another high. And for the green set of alternating pivots, I need another high. Well, watch what price does. Price breaks the top of the range with one bar, leaves a high, closes right back in the range here. So I'm going to see what I marked, a green and a red alternating pivot right here. And price trades right back inside the range and the upper green parallel. So even though price has gapped higher, the lines of maximum excursion show deceleration. Price is slowing down. In shorthand, I would say that the two-dimensional, it is making new highs, and the three-dimensional, it's not. And that will be clear. You'll see that in another slide. But this tells me this might be a significant high, because we're making new two-dimensional highs, but we're not making new three-dimensional highs. Okay? Take a look. Here's our line of maximum excursion. And here's our second line of maximum excursion. And you can see the slope has decreased. But here's the two-dimensional high or horizontal high. And here's the next two-dimensional high or horizontal high. And it's higher. So our lines of maximum excursion are pointing down. And these don't lag, by the way. These are instantaneous. Our two dimensions are higher. Our three dimensions are lower. The two, the two have to come back in the balance. Here we are. We've blown it up again. So we've got the bottom of the gap. We've got the top of the gap. We've got this high, 
which was above two dimensions above this side. But when we connected our line to vacuum excursion, this is actually a lower three-dimensional high. We don't want to pick a top. We want to pick a shoulder or a weak reaction. So look at price curl and then come back down, come then back up. And you can see I drew in the downsloping red median line from this side. I'm going to die for you. From this high to this low to this high. And that gave me this median line set. And we come up and we test it. So this is the top. This is the shoulder when we test the upper parallel. And look at the next line. A great deal of separation. We close down here after opening up here. Great deal of separation. So this is the weak reaction right here. And I take advantage of it. So here's what I want to do. Again, I'm using a 20-pip go-no-go fire. I'm willing to risk 20 pips. That's one stop. I've already got four plus in my account that I made from the prior trade. The gap is still open. The red median line comes from this eye, this low, and this eye. This is the top. The test of this red line right here this is the top. The test of the red line is right here. This is the top. This is the shoulder. I want to sell a weak reaction. So I'm willing to put in an order right here. This is for the next bar. If it comes back near its high, this will be a lower high than this high. This will be the top. This will be the shoulder or the weak reaction. My stop will be 20 pips, be well above this high, and let me erase one line. I'll be looking for multiples of my stops. You can see one, that's two stops lower, which is also at the lower median line. And this is the bottom of the gap. So my two problems in front of me are three. Top of the gap, the bottom of the gap, and the lower parallel. Trade man. If price fills the gap, meaning it gets into here, it is slightly less than two stops. Unless you have millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, and are trading for a hedge fund, I would suggest and if you get down close to this area, that you move to break even. Go from a stop up here to break even. Right here. Why? Because we've got top of the gap and also median line theory, which is mathematical. It says price may run out of energy right here. Uh, yeah, we've got that. So, as price is moving toward this median line, with 80% probability, it will get there. Once it gets there, the 43% probability, it'll turn up. 43%, it'll turn down the balance. It'll congest. If it breaks lower, with 80% probability, it's going to go to the lower parallel. Once there, it's going to re it's going to reverse or go lower 43% of the time each time or sideways. So think about it this way. You're going down the highway at 80 miles an hour. You get past here, we're going toward 
this area at 80 miles an hour. But when we get here, we have to jam on the brakes to 43 miles an hour. At some point, you need to lock in what we call a lotto ticket. I can't lose money on this, and if it breaks through this lower parallel, it should run. So if that doesn't make sense to you now, when you review the tape, it'll make more sense. If you want to read Andrew's original material, um, at the end of the seminar, I'll show you the, the, uh, the web link to get to it, free resources, and you can read exactly what he says about the probabilities of price. So here's what happens. This is the top. This was what I was hoping, I should use the word hope, that my plan, technically, I was looking for a lower high, a shoulder, and I want to sell a weak reaction. So what did we get? We got a wide range bar lower, we closed lower. That gave me great separation, which tells me it's a weak reaction. I put an order in to sell the next time price tested this upper parallel. Price came in on the very next line. You can see. And even got above it. No problem getting short. Now what did price do? Curl lower. Came up, left a lower high, curled down, curled up, left another lower high. I don't know if I'd be selling this one if I were you, because look at how strong it was it as approached. But now we've got a high, a second low, a third low. I think I trust what's going on. If you miss this sell, you can still sell here. You can afford 20 pips to be short here and have your stop five pips or more above the C pivot. Okay? So this is a good secondary entry and you know more about the market. Let's continue with it. Price comes up for the secondary entry. Right here. Now watch, it's very scary, unless you've done your homework. We look at the ATR, we add noise to it, we came up with the 20 pip go no go bar. My original short is actually right here. My stop is all the way up here. If you missed it, this is the secondary entry. It still allows you to have a stop well above the C pivot. Price does fluctuate up. But looks where it stopped. Look where it stops. It stops below our original entry. And if we go ahead and put out the lines of maximum excursion, here's our first one. And as we curl back here, we go we go to the median line right there. And then curl back, and you can see when we connect this high to this high. Take a look. Price is accelerating to the downside, even though it's still in this big range. Price is accelerating to the downside. If you're short, you want this small line of maximum excursion that's pointing up to be broken. It can be broken soon. Right here. The price is accelerating to the downside. So just relax and let price do its thing. And you know this, and most of the market only sees a range. So you're short or short here, and price is accelerating, even though it's within this big range. Just relax. There we go. So, here's our original entry. Here's our secondary entry. Price came back up. And you can see, watch price accelerate. 
It's in a range. Here's the range. Now watch price accelerate. We connect this to this one, and we get this line of max inserted. We connect this one to this one, and we get this line of max inserted. Then we connect these double tops, the top here, to here. This is more a line of force, but here's our pullback. See the little girl connected? That's our third line of maximum excursion. Take a look. Higher, steeper, down to the downside, very steep. We're really accelerating. Haven't broken out of the range yet when we draw this. Sorry, erase this. Watch carefully. Draw this. From the one up above, when we draw this, we're still in the range. So we have this information before we break out. That's far ahead of the market. Take a look at it. We have it before, a couple bars before, and then it stalls. And then look what happens. Price plunges. And we've gone from trading to a range looking for a bottom. And you can see all the way along, I have been working. This is the upper parallel. This is the median line. This is the lower parallel. And this is called the first warning line. You can see they're all equidistant. And Andrews would have four of these sitting out here. What I had planned was, <coughs> excuse me, if we just get to the first warning line, I'll take my money, reevaluate price, and I can always trade again. Well, in one, just like the prior trade, it's like a gift in one bar. Look at what price does. So I take my money out. If I do the bottom, I have no idea because it certainly is accelerated. But I'm trading against the frequency of this warning, excuse me, this median line at this first warning line. And I've got, I don't know, a good five to one or so. Let's see what I run. I sold a weak reaction back to the red upper parallel at 167.35. My initial stop was 20 pips from the beginning of the trade. The lines of maximum excursion were accelerating to the downside. And when they really sped up here, Price plunged and hit my profit target at the first warning line, which is this line right here, at 166.35 for a risk reward of exactly 5 to 1. Again, these are not long-term trades. These are what I consider intraday trades. So I took out four and change in the first trade. Now I took out 5 to 1. So in terms of how you manage your trading account. In the first trade, I rolled forward four and a half stops, which means I can be wrong more than four times and still be trading with the market's money. That's all good. Now, I just rolled forward another five stops. Now I'm working with nine and a half stops. I can be wrong nine times and still be trading with the market's money. You just pile up these stops as the month goes on. Instead of looking for the big hit, at the end of the month, you'll have a very nice pile. If you do this time after time after time, those of you who have been here for a long time or um, study under Shane and I know we call this making the donuts. Uh, my friend uh, on the board at the Merck, Bill Shepard, well, another magnificent trader. He calls it slicing sausage. It seems like you want to keep going for the big hits. And we did catch two plunge, two plunges lower. But we did it by taking some money, getting out, taking some more money, and getting out. Let's see. Okay. 
So that's the end of the charts. I'm sure people have all kinds of questions. But before we get to questions, two things. Free information, go to marketgeometry.com, look for free information. There's all kinds of things. You can read Dr. Andrews' original 65-page action reaction uh, course that he sold for $1,500 in 1965. Um, there's all the links to all the IB sessions uh, that I've done. And Cynthia, I'm adding five more that you don't have this week, as well as a couple lectures that I did at MIT and about ten that I did with uh, Barbara Schmidt Bailey at both the CBOT and CME. Um, so there's all kinds of links to free videos. Um, you have to buy anything. There's a, over a hundred articles. Now, Cynthia is about to open up a poll for you. I know because I've done this a lot. When you get the poll, this is not for me. This is for Cynthia. In the center, you're going to say whether you liked it or whether you didn't like it. But in the center, there's going to be an area where you can type. And you only got 45 seconds. Go to that center section as soon as you hit the, I like it, I didn't like it, whatever. Where it says suggestion, type in either webinar or more Cynthia. And that will give Cynthia more power from Mr. Peter Fly, the owner of IB. Cynthia? All right, did that, but you deserve it. Well, thank you so much, Kim. But I'm going to go ahead and open up the poll that Kim was just talking about. You'll notice there are only three short questions. And actually, what number two, I'm, what I'm looking for there are any comments or suggestions that you might have about additional topics you'd like to see handled in these webinars. And as Kim mentioned, the poll is going to be open only very shortly. So make sure that you make your selection and then uh, click that Submit button so that I can um, compile all of those results. Now, also, those of you who have finished the poll can use the X that's included in the title bar there and close the polling panel out of your way. Um, I know there have been quite a few questions that have come in, so I have reactivated the chat panel. So I'm going to ask anyone who sent a question previously, uh, you can simply copy and replace that question, sending it to all participants so that we can all benefit from your comments. Poll did just end, everyone, so thank you very much. Close that polling panel out of your way using the X that's included in the title bar. And then, if you're not seeing your chat panel, you'll notice it's highlighted in red over on the right-hand side of your screen. Simply click that title bar, and it will reactivate the chat panel so that you can uh, send any comments or questions um, for from today's event. Um, okay, back to you. Can I go? <laughs> yep. All right. Willie, um, first of all, I am going to continue. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I will be here at least every second Thursday of the month. So um, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you've been coming. Please keep keep coming. And you have a great day. Thanks for spending time with us. Um, let's see, Dr. Morge, after your last seminar, I bought your book. Oh, yeah. Um, didn't have a link to the breakfast sessions, and the blog seems to have been last a bit. Okay. What am I missing about the blogs? You're missing that Shane and I are still learning a, a brand new web page. So blogs are coming, and uh, as are new articles. You're not missing any of that. Um, in terms of uh, the breakfast sessions, if you email, they'll be highlighted. Uh, they asked for a change on the web page. Should be coming soon. If you want to know more about the breakfast sessions, which are advanced classes, you can always email me. It's uh, right here. Timothy Morris at gmail .com. Um, and I'll 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 send you a link, but it, it will be more uh, easily available soon. Um, you sent me two emails. I get a lot of emails. Do me a favor, say I B question in the subject, and I always pay attention to Cynthia's emails. All right, so wow, Willie says. What does 34 and 200 average true range mean? So this average true range, it just gives us a measurement of how price was moving over the past 34 bars and over the past 200 bars. We're just trying to get a feel for whether uh, the, range, the volatility is increasing or decreasing. And that will also help us figure out how much noise we have to add to the two. Uh, let's see. How do I handle economic data releases in the news? Frank, that's a great question. 
Um, I don't know if you know, I have a degree in economics. When I first started trading, I used to use economic releases because I was faster than the average bear, and people were just, you know, the Internet was barely starting. Well, in fact, when I first started trading, there was no Internet. There was, there, were, there was just DARPA, which was the defense community, and I could get onto that at the University of Chicago, but the Internet really hadn't, hadn't taken off. But, and so you would find out by going, um, listening to the news, uh, the evening news, reading the newspaper, what the economic rela- releases were. Since I was working at an institution, we had people that would call us directly from the press conference to tell us the releases. So there was an edge. These days, the people that pay hundreds of millions of dollars, literally, for all this fundamental information, large institutions, they have no edge. You get the news at the same time they do. So now it's become a game of reaction to the reaction to the reaction to the reaction to the reaction. I'm not playing that game anymore. That's, that's not a, an edge anymore. So instead, I just choose technical analysis. What do I do about news? I take the current calendar. You can get it from the CME, CME page that uh, he was talking about earlier. And I literally just take a ruler so that the time of the releases are on the left and the subject's on the right, and I rip off the page so it's in two parts. And I throw away what the subject is. I don't care. But I might want to know that there's a important release coming out at 7.30 or 8. And if I don't have a position, I might hold off five or ten minutes to see if the volatility spikes. And that's, a, that's about how I handle it. I really don't care. A lot of times that news drives me to profit or gives me the pullback that I need for an entry. So I, I'm ready. I'm there. It's not a scary drop or a scary spike high to me. It's price doing what it needs to do. How does ATR relate to stop size? We take a look at ATR. You took a, take a look at normal bars on the page, not the huge wide bars. We want to cover about 80% of those bars. So that means we probably, for example, in the pound, we generally use about two times the ATR and three pips per stop. Most currencies will use some amount of the ATR. It's always more than one ATR. It's generally closer to one and two thirds, maybe two. And then we add three to five on top of that. The way to do that is take a look at prior tops of waves. Let's see. Uh, okay, Eric, how are you? Um, when do you use ATR 34 or 55? Um, it doesn't matter. You can have 55 and 200 or 34 and 200. You just want to use two different ones. You can get by t- just using 200 if you want, but I like to have two because the shorter one will tell me what's happening immediately. The longer one will give me the bigger picture of what's happening to volatility. Um, hi, Ken. How are you? Um, I always look forward to learning. Right? Thank you. Uh, yep, I appreciate it. And, and kudos to Cynthia and the CME. I'm going to give them the, C, the CME and Cynthia for you. Um, hi, Heiko. Do I understand you right? You recommend moving the stop to break even if two to one level is reached. Well, that's part of it. The other part is that we were getting toward that median line and also uh, – just below the bottom of the gap. So that was an area where if we were going to find buyers, we probably would. So if price, remember, we went from 80% to 43% when we get to that lower parallel. So, and, and that's at 2 to 1. I wouldn't move before 2 to 1. But as we get toward 2 to 1 and we're toward an area where price may turn, I don't want to let that turn into a loss. You have to take your money, but don't let it turn into a loss. Johnny, thank you. I am feeling better. Thank you for showing up. How you doing? Um, let's see. Hi, Albert. How are you doing? First meeting line set all penny pivots. Pivot one. Yes, I was true on that. Yep. If you go, if you go and look at the slide before that, you'll be able to find a quality low, high, low. Apparently, I didn't catch it when I edited it. And I, you know, I'm always in a hurry when I do these. I spend about 20 hours, but it's always a frenzy at the end to clean things up and, and, and sometimes it gets crazy. 
So, um, yeah, that one is drawn incorrectly, which was high, high, low. It needs to be alternating. But if you look, there's a quality low as the first alternating pivot. Um, as usually, they have super best. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, can we do rolling chop, sometimes especially wheat or soy? Uh, maybe on soy meal, Johnny. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of my favorite trading uh, methods. And we haven't done it. If you, now, if you go back and look at the IVs, you'll see that we've used rolling chop on a lot of things. And the ones that I'm adding um, shortly to the website is a set of rolling chops from Chicago Board of Trade over there owned by the CME. Um, and there's a beautiful one there. Um, on grades. Yeah, more Cynthia, or are we running low? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone, uh, the chat panel and the new software, it's getting a little difficult to keep up with all of your questions. Yeah. But Tim has not responded. I also see that some are going to all attendees that um, Tim cannot see. So if we haven't mm. answered your question, if you would, please copy it from the chat panel. But just make sure in the send to box, it goes to all participants. That way we're all sure to uh, view that information and Tim will respond. Now, while you are taking a look at that, Tim, I'm actually going to grab all that back from you for a moment. Oh, are you going to show me my favorite page? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the one we I do the as, the, as the star. Um, oh, no. Now, we do have all of Tim's um, webinars that he's done with Interactive Brokers are listed out on our website. And so notice what I'm going to do right now with you is share my desktop and show you where you can locate them as well. Um, bringing up the, trader, or the Interactive Broker website, go to the Education menu. You'll find the webinars link is included right at the top of that uh, section. Now, um, I'm going to go into the recorded webinars because this is buried a little bit on our website and into the industry sponsored tab, which is where you can find all of Tim's information. But notice, it is interspersed with other webinars that we've done. So the easiest thing for you to do is simply come up to all speakers and then scroll down to Tim's name here. And notice it will take you to a page that has just Tim's webinars available. Now, notice uh, we go back quite, I'm only back to 2012 here. So we have a wealth of knowledge here. Thank you very much, Tim. 2005. <laughs> Back to 2007. Now, also notice there's a notes link. So all of the slides uh, for each individual presentation are also available here. Now, as a tip for you, there's um, I do want you to remember the industry sponsored tab and filtering by Tim's name because I include a link to this page in the follow-up messages you'll get after today's session. So you'll get a direct link to today's recording, but the extra link on there takes you to this page where you can filter by his name and find all of those previous recordings. Now, also, be aware that you can always get them from the Market Geometry site as well. Sounds like they're even posting some more out there. So let's move back over into the um, event window and see if we do have some additional questions. Yeah, we're getting, we're getting some. Uh, I knew there were more that were coming in. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you want to see Dr. Andrew's original material, go to marketgeometry.com. Hey there. And then on top, up in here, you'll see free info. Just click on the tab. You'll see uh, articles. You'll see past videos and webinars, which is where you'll find all the IV materials, as well as some stuff from earlier than since I, which is a long time ago, 2008. But to go back all the way to 2003, um, you'll, we're about to put up a couple uh, lectures from the, uh, Sloan graduate. School of Business at MIT. They, they're allowing us to put up a couple lectures. Um, so that'll be interesting, as well as some older material. So just go to marketgeometry.com, look at the free section. I don't care if you spend a dime, but the free section, you can spend a year, two years, and still have lots to look at. Okay. And if you get lost, send me an email, say ID question in the subject so that I know it's important, and I'll pick it up. Don't worry about it. So let's see. Do I pay attention to any fundamentals, Peter? Nope. Don't care. I mean, first of all, believe it or not, here's how I get the news. I, I, when I get out of bed at 3 in the morning, 
My wife gets out of the bed at mm. 5 o'clock because the kids have to go to school at an hour or so later, but she likes to have coffee. She reads uh, a couple of publications, the, the local courier, and she goes to the Chicago Tribune. Um, and when I come back to get some coffee, and she's like, all right, she's having coffee. She, I get her some coffee. I get my tea. I walk over to her desk. I say, hey, dear, is there anything I need to know today? And she say, oh, they, this is happening in uh, Ukraine. This is happening in ISIS. Um, and this is what's happening local. She'll give me a couple of things. That's it. I don't read the news, ever. When I watch TV, the only thing I watch are movies that I recorded or DVDs that I bought. I don't, I just don't watch that stuff. So I try and isolate myself because it, otherwise it'll give me an opinion. So, you know, if you ask me, I've known every Fed chairman, I, you know, I've known, I knew Paul Volcker, Paul Volcker well, well, I still know him while he's not gone, but, um, you know, I knew Alan Greenspan. I knew Barney. Um, this Yellen, I don't know. So I don't really care. We'll see how she does, but I'll know by price how she's doing. So let's see. Hi, Lyle. How are you? I, I appreciate you taking your time. Uh, I don't think you've discussed third dimension trading in a webinar before. Well, you, you'll be seeing more of it. Um, and I hope, again, as you saw today, it was relatively clear. I was fumbling a little bit, and I apologize for that. The uh, cursor setup is different. Um, but hopefully it was clear. And as you go back and review slides and or watch the tape, um, you can pick more out of it. But it, you'll see more and more of it. Um, in your second trade, says Tom, Tomas, how are you? Um, how do you know planning a price wouldn't stop at middle just before top of the gap? What makes you think the price will go to the lower middle before the gap? Um, if you remember, price had begin, it was beginning more and more volatile. And on the left, come on, we had a huge range. So I don't really have to worry about price moving without time. Time's already loaded. So when price starts to move and is moving with a lot of velocity, I'm not that worried about it as long as it gets through the median line, I'm just going to let it give you the kind of line that you saw. And in fact, Tomas, if you actually take the time to go back and look, and every, anybody can look at a chart, you can see the dates on the screens. I think it started on the 15th of August. Um, but the second trade was almost at the end of the month. Um, I actually kept the trade open longer but we don't have time in this seminar for me to show how I box profits all the way down. It took another, I don't know, 150, 160 pips additional out of that trade. But if I were you and I was just day trading, that's where I would have taken profit, as well as I let it run, actually, for another three or four days. Um, let's see. Do I use – I fill a power out. Do you use any software to help you keep track of chart price? I actually – Generally, chart with Ensign software, and the reason why I use Ensign is because most of the students at Market Geometry prefer Ensign. It's the easiest thing to draw on. I, I own every piece of software. As soon as a new piece of software comes out, people send it to me and ask me to evaluate it, put it on my machine, try it. So I have it. For example, Cynthia IB has a brand new set of software, and I've owned that software for the longest time. So I have that. I'm conversant and when they're fully operational, maybe actually I should do a seminar completely on that software, because it's fine. Um, so generally I, I chart an ensign, but it's because most of the people at Market Geometry chart an ensign. Um, I don't use price alerts. Um, I do have an edge over you guys. I have my own private brokers. They're called the Gray Dudes. Um, they, they're people that work for at least 15 years with me, and there's, there's 10 of them now. And uh, we're, we now have two locations. One is in Chicago, right across from the what used to be the Chicago Board of Trade is now called the Merck. They have a, uh, a two-story flat there. And then I also have uh, two in London, um, relatively close to the palace, with my great my man of 20 for the Queen. So, um, and they they can keep track of things from when I'm sleeping. All right, just before your four to one trade, can you explain why did you use a pivot A B C as a Oh, well, no, no. Tomas, I already explained. 
I use an alternating pivot, but that's an error in the chart in the chart that I showed. If you go back and look, you'll be able to find the low, and it should have been a low high low. So pivot A should have been a low. My fault. Um, yeah, Hugo. I'm sorry, Hugo. Thanks for coming. Um, and I'm sorry. He, he says this, and I agree with him. I make it look so easy. It is true. I realize that I need a lot of patience in order to learn this. It is true. This is a process. Think of this like a university education. You're not going to learn it in six weeks. You're probably not going to learn it in six months. But you have to keep at it. And remember that the money that you put on the table, if you're not already profitable, you need to think of that as money that you're going to learn on. So trade small. You have to say in archery, aim small, fail small. Same thing here. Trade small, even sim trade while you're learning so you get the concepts. Because you don't want to be out of capital just when your the light bulb comes on. But it, it does take time. It is not as easy as I make it to look, and I apologize for that, but I'm trying to give you the most education for the time that you have to spend here. Um, Tim, on the beginning. On the beginning, when price returned to the bottom of the range, the close on a high, making good celebration, how do we know if this is no buy signal? Is it previous speed of slope? Yeah, that's what I was trying to point out is that even though we had a bar that closed back up with great separation, we had bars and lines that were showing us that price was slowing down and going heading to the downside. And that's a, that's a clue that you would have that the rest of the market doesn't have. We're trying to give you that four or five step ahead of the rest of the market edge. Um, hi, Jorge. How are you? These IBM brands were the key beginning of my trading career. Thank you, Jorge. And I know you've, you've really improved o over the last year or so. How can you tell a price action is a real signal or just noise? Well, Steve, I'd be a liar if I said I can tell anything, you know, with 100% accuracy. The honest truth is, and maybe no one, I don't know if other, other educators or traders would tell you this, as the bar is unfolding, how do you know that it's not a bad, it's not bad data? You don't know. You only know what you have. You only know the process of education you've gone through. Okay, and when you see things a number of times in practice, you know that with some amount of probability, X will happen. And that's an opportunity that you can put your plan together. Sometimes you will be wrong. Sometimes it will just be noise. But if you just sit and wait for confirmation, for example, on this pound trade, the confirmation when we took out lows was three quarters in the profit. So this is a, a way for you to trade all before the market has a clue that we're breaking out to the downside and keep a much greater piece of the pie and get out quick. Um, uh, my apologies. So he says, here's where I get in. There are other instances where you're pointing, but we couldn't see your cursor. Yeah, I, my apologies. It's a new WebEx, as Cynthia said. It just changed last night. I've never seen this version. And I, I certainly fumbled the cursor. I'll, I'll, I'll practice with Cynthia before the next one, I promise. But if you go through the slides and listen to what I'm saying, it, it's, it's, you can decipher it. Hi, John. How are you? Is probability based on implied volatility? Nope. Don't, never say anything about implied volatility. A method to determine the probable path of price when measured from a major, major pivot that is B or C. No. Probabilities are based from either the median lines, which have alternating highs, high, low, high, except for the bad one that I threw at the beginning, which you'll go back and correct. That has a mathematical probability that we know from doing statistics. There's been four doctoral dissertations done on my statistics as well as prior to that. I did all the work on Andrew's original statistics. So we know those probabilities and what they point to. Or if we take a look at these lines on the maximum excursion, they're telling you the speed of price. 
and it's simple Newtonian physics. So we don't care about implied volatility. The travel path of price comes from either our alternating pivots or what, what's going on with the speed of price. Uh, let's see. Hey, Carolyn. Oh, my brother. There's, um, there's six of us left in the Coral Gable groups, which were uh, members of Dr. Andrew's original inner circle. And some of my brothers always show up, say hi, uh, give hugs to my children and my wife. I do miss you. I'm actually planning on coming to Florida, and I will come. All, everybody except for me lives in Florida. And I will, I will come, we'll, uh, sit out in the sun, and have some fresh fish and enjoy an afternoon together. I miss you. Do I use many median lines? I think part of you emailed me. Do I use many median lines to your trading? Many median lines um, were extremely important when Andrews was just doing dailies. And he, remember, Dr. Andrews died in 1987. But even though there was intraday data and it was just becoming popular in the mid-80s, we tried to give him a computer with intraday data. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. All of his notes are typed on this ratty um, a typewriter with, uh, yeah, and they're really hard to reproduce because they're done with uh, carbon paper. Um, he wouldn't look at intraday charts, didn't want to know about them. And so many media lines, it's very hard on daily, weeklies, and monthlies if you're looking for turns because there aren't that many pivots. So you would use a lot of many media lines. If you use the same methodology, many media lines, in five-minute E-mini S&Ps, your, lot, your uh, capital will soon be gone. So do I use them? Yes, at the right time. But their, their importance is certainly overstated, especially by other people that are now trying to teach Andrew's methods because I made it popular, um, that all they've done is read Andrew's work on daily charts, and then they try and push forward something without doing any research. There's much better ways to tell what's going on on an intraday chart than using many, many lines. Not that they're not important, but they're, they have a much smaller use in intraday trading. Uh, let's see. Today's charts were, hi, Bernie. Today's charts were 20 minutes, not one hour or four hours, 20 minutes. <laughs> hi, Mary. Those huge magenta lines are distracting. Okay, well, yeah, I'm trying. Uh, Cynthia, I'm going to have to get a, a lesson from you. I couldn't find a darn. Well, you know what? Oh, it's going to make me mad. There's a pointer. Okay. The third icon down on the left. I see it. Uh, now. See, I went through that whole thing going, where the heck is a pointer? Oh, I got it. Well, we'll okay. get it uh, uh, down pat for the next session. Yeah, right, this Mary. was kind of a surprise here today uh, to open it up and see that we have been upgraded. But um, this is the okay. version, so we'll get used to it. You know what? I'm sure there's – well, there's one good thing was I don't have to use the phone, so the sound is better. So I'll, I'll get the drawing done. Don't worry about it. Mary, and I apologize for this time. And, yeah, they were distracting for me, and believe me, the whole time – I'm listening to an echo, which I'm, I'll get rid of for next time. But also, I'm going, I know there's a point on where is it? So, we can look at it, don't worry. But I apologize. Uh, let's see. TJ says, are fibs any good? Um, I'll tell you what I would use it for. In fact, if you've ever heard of Joe DiNapoli, he's a close, close buddy of mine. I've known him since the mid-80s. And, um, you know, when we do, we go and do seminars, and he's in one room and I'm in another room, we send notes back and forth making fun of each other, or I'll make some comment in my seminar, and then somebody will run and tell him, and then he'll make a comment in his seminar. Well, I'm running jokes with him. But if you watch, if you actually know how he trades, I agree with him. Know where the fibs are at if you want, because there's going to be orders there. There's a lot of fib traders. Am I going to trade with the fib traders? Probably not. But I'm going to, I want to know where their orders are, and I may actually use my size, or I may wait to see what happened at their orders, see if they get blown, or see if they hold, and then change my strategy. But I'm not a fib trader, and I, if you go back to my earlier work, you will see fibs on my earlier work, but you'll see that when I was using it more 
to know where the areas were at. So there's so many FIB traders. Yeah, it's okay to know where it's at. Um, come on. So when a new swing is established, this price this price is working its way to back to this swing to check it out. If turn it back at some point. Um, could you could you re repeat that? I'm not really sure what you mean. Do I only trade on 20 minute charts? No, Bob. I trade. I keep a portfolio for especially for my investors. Queen. That's almost all royalty now, actually. Um, dailies, weeklies, and monthlies. And some of these trades, you know, go on for years. Some of them go for months. Some of them go for weeks. And uh, we have a huge position in the pound right now. Uh, we have a huge euro short right now. Um, and then we have some trades that go a week, two weeks, three weeks. And those might be on 240s. If I get up. You know, it's kind of a luxury these days, these days, Bob, for me to have time to intraday chart more than about three days a week at about three or four hours, even though I get up at three. Um, I just have that much stuff. I teach at uh, MIT in the morning, Stanford in the afternoon, virtually, and plus I teach um, at Market Geometry um, our foundation courses at Market Maps with my partner Shane, who carries most of the most of the most of the work and does a great job, um, and then I teach the advanced classes. At breakfast with the master and eating with the master, and then of course the only outside place that I teach is interactive brokers and the CME. So um, when I intraday chart, I start out with 20-minute charts, but I also use a lot of tick charts, and I try not to just show tick charts here, even though I'm prone to liking tick charts because I know a lot of you don't have tick data. So when I have the opportunity, I show 20-minute charts because it's easier for you. To do that, uh, Peter, whatever you said, just oh, I know I said for setting up your go no go. I need a little bit of understanding on how to implement the ATR and adding it to go no go. I know to go three to five pips above structure, right? But how do I add the ATR, especially when volatility peaks up? Okay, you want to take a look at. And I think Shane has a magic number. I haven't done the work, but I'm going to go with him. Um, you don't want to look more than about a hundred. 125 bars on your chart. That's it. You don't want to squeeze in and look at all that data because you're just going to get lost at highs and lows that really don't matter anymore. And we've gone to a saying, look to the right. What's the price doing now? But you do need to look back and see, has the ATR, if you just drew a, a bar the size of the a, ATR, does it cover 80% of the bars? If, if it doesn't, then you need bigger than the ATR. Most of the time, you are going to need one and a half, one and three quarters, maybe twice the ATR. If you, if you see it growing, you need to pay attention, and you may need to increase the size of your goal and goal. Now, here's one thing that you should know that maybe I haven't said enough times here. When I intraday trade on currencies, I don't use an ATR. A go no go of two, uh, 25 pips or $250 ever. That's it. That's my maximum risk per trade when I trade currency futures. Okay? So we start out with that premise. Most of the time, I'm at 20. Also, I never use a stop or go no go bar less than 15 ticks or pips. So I'm between 25 and 15. Okay? I also always have, as you said, that I have my stop either three to five pips above structure or three to five pips below structure, depending on whether I'm going long, long or short. But the ATR just gives me a feel for what's happening with volatility. Then you can see, does that measure of volatility cover 80% of the bars, or do I need a larger one? And generally, like I said, you're going to need some multiple. Shane did a, we did a, Nine-hour seminar, um, treat your training like a business. It's the seminar number two on the webpage. We didn't. It's nine hours. She can get a four-hour dissertation on that that's really magnificent that shows you how to use volatility to decide your stops and as well as your noise, ETR for your noise. I, I certainly couldn't have done, done it better. Uh, John says, when using a test, retest, or an entry, I found waiting for price to get to the previous major pivot more safe. That's absolutely true. That's my favorite entry. 
Is this the best method to avoid getting taken out? Yeah, John, I uh, invented that about 1999, 2000. I had a partner. He was a programmer for HP prior to retiring. And he came to me and he said, I'll code for you if you teach me how to trade, which I thought was a fair. And um, he built a database that we could ask questions. And I hate it when you enter and then price just makes this huge wide bar and runs right through you. And and like you, I didn't want to, I don't like getting taken out like that. I don't mind being wrong, but it always makes me feel like I missed something. And what we found is this test, retest, takes that out about 80% of the time. Now, it also means you're going to miss about 20 to 25% of the trades. But I'm willing to do that to miss getting beat up on that wide range bar that just zooms right through me. I hate the way that feels. So, yeah, test and retest, I'm all over that. Norman, still. Um, you often say there's a mathematical relationship in the pivots and the median line. What's the percent retracement from an A pivot or a C pivot? No, it's not that kind of relationship. Let me see this call. It's a relationship between, once we draw out those slope lines, the upper parallel, the median line, and the lower parallel. It's the relationship between how price follows that probable path of price inside of those. And we know, for example, the price is at the upper parallel that turns and is heading lower. 80% of the time, it'll make it to that median line. Okay. Then, as I said, we know from statistics that once it gets to the median line, 43% of the time it'll reverse, 43% of the time it'll zoom and continue through and the balance it'll consolidate. So those are the statistics or mathematical relationships that we know. And it actually comes from that relationship between A, B, and C. Okay? I don't those don't tell you that you're going to move from C to B with a percentage. Okay? Um, hi Stefan, how are you? Um, what is or what is not market structure? Ah, okay. Well, Major highs, major lows, which go swing highs, swing lows. Those are the most important market structures, okay? We also have three-dimensional market structure. Um, we showed a little bit here, but we didn't show how to use it. But if you have tested frequency, which is a slope line, can I draw here? Let me see. So if we have a slope line like this that's been tested, 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 this becomes market structure. Now, you don't want to use it after 34 tests, although I've seen them work that long. But, you know, if it's been tested a couple times, especially if you get a test sitting here, you can put your stop above the prior test, and that becomes market structure. Because what happens is these highs, people that miss the sell move down to this one. And if they don't get filled here, they'll move down to this one. If they don't get filled here, they'll move down to this one. Until they run out of sellers, then the market will turn. So we've got market highs, market lows. We also have sloped, three-dimensional, tested lines, lines of frequency. Um, gaps give us a high and a low. So if we have an open gap like this, we have, I'm sorry, Mary, these are so wide. Pointer, stupid. Here we go. Can you guys see that? So no, we're not we've, seeing it. Okay, I'm if going back. Yeah. I'm if going you back have the there. corner, you'll have to clip. So um, you can either. We'll, we'll, you, we'll work, you and I will work on that. Right. Okay, so I'll go back to this. So we've got a pivot here and a pivot here. So that's market structure. So there's lots of different kinds of market structure. Yes. Did you want me to help you? No, my headset was just dying, so I okay. Just got, oh, uh, I hope I hope you can resurrect it. I'm back on the, I'm, I'm the speaker now. We're still okay. good. Uh, let's see. Hi, Ken. How are you? Nice to see you. I expect you're enjoying Arizona. Yes, I am. Uh, you've been in paradise? Okay. Yeah. It's about an hour and a half below me. It really is paradise. Yep. Yeah. I'll have to visit you. Uh, Stefan says, I may have missed it, but could you define alternating pivots? Sure. I did a bad job on the first meeting line. You can go back and correct me, but alternating pivots are a high then a low. Then a high, or a low, then a high, then a low. Those are alternating pivots. And see, in this one, 
it would always be up sloping. And this one it would always be down sloping if we're drawing median lines. Do I did I use indicators in my younger days? Bob, I know every indicator there is. In fact, I'm giving away my entire library. My wife rebuilt the bad cave, the office here that's under the mountain. And I have a brand new desk, sit down, stand up desk. Everything else is out of the room except for instead of five bookcases, I have one. It has about six books on it. And so all the books that I collected from my old days, even some of them that had, you know, chapters for me, um, a couple of books about me, um, stuff from Milton Friedman, et cetera, et cetera. I'm giving it all away. And um, so, and a lot of it was about indicators. So I know all about indicators, including current indicators. I've got a PhD in math and physics, so I understand them all. I just, they all, almost all um, lag, so I just, I'm not interested. Um, does this approach work for stocks, Amir? Yes. Um, we teach eating with the master, which is advanced, um, an advanced class, uh, twice a month. And eating with the master is about portfolio trading. I'm one of the best portfolio traders in the world. Um, and a lot of our work is at stocks. We got everybody on Facebook at the 2360. Um, everybody's got had a nice shot at Wuba, 10 cents. Um, we've got everybody long at Nokia, and we're looking at Alibaba, waiting for that to get long. So, and we also have, and, and stuff, somebody's asked me about the fifth grade program as well. Yeah. And, um, the fifth graders, um, we're actually we're up to 70 some schools this year, and I can't even count the number of kids. Um, but the fifth graders, you know, basically, only trade stocks and only from the long side, and they outperform the average um, hedge fund manager. So, yeah, it works with stocks. Um, I do not have a link to fifth day programming because we're going through a, I'm not, uh, the Dell Corporation who's doing all the sponsoring and the schools are going through this, in my opinion, petty fight about um, who has the rights to what. So I'm just teaching and staying out of the way. Eventually here, I hope to have a link to share with people. But right now, it's just that part is just silliness, and the kids should be involved. So let's see. Um, after pricing is the median line, the retest per Dr. Andrews. Also, Norman knows the work. You often use the retest as entry. Yep. Can you talk about entries midstream at the median line? Well, as long as you have structure. So here's our median line. Price zooms through, comes back here. If you can afford to put your stop above C, or if you have some congestion up here and then a breakthrough, you can afford to put your stop. You need a stop that's above market structure, then you're fine entering midstream. And if you go back and look at some of the prior seminars or the free material on market geometry, there's all kinds of work on that. With a thick line, I thought it was part of the crayon drawing presentation. Oh, thank you, Eric. That makes you feel a little better. They look like crayons. That's about how good my crayon drawing looks, believe me. How do you determine that the right shoulder is weak so you can sell into it? Well, Julie, the first clue is that it's lower. So you're going to anticipate. You're going to tactically think. By the way, that's one of the things that we're going to be doing. We have Battle Commander Joey Powell coming in um, to do these seminars to help us with tactical thinking. He's uh, a black ops battle commander. And so you're going to be tactically thinking, and you're, you're going to be looking at these lines that show you that price is slowing down or decelerating. And as it leaves a high, pulls back with a nice wide range bar, starts to turn back. Your tactical thought is that the shoulder is going to be weak. And you make sure that your go no go gives you plenty of room. As you can see on the first one, I missed getting stopped out only about, I don't know, three to five pips. I don't remember whether it was three or four or five, but not by much. So you need a good go no bar. You need to be able to use um, that market structure as, as protection. And, and think tactically. So hopefully that'll help. He says, so when you say 125 20 minute bars, that's like 110 days worth. Oh, no, 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 no. Stop. Think about this. 125 20 minute bars in a day, take 20 minutes and divide it into how many minutes are in a day, and you'll see it's not, not many days worth at all. We're talking about, it's generally three days, four days, something like that. So you only use 
ATR, other indicators. No, I don't even use ATR as an indicator other than to just remind me to check volatility. But, yeah, I don't use any other indicators. So, have you seen any reliable markets that lead the stock market like high yield bonds, et cetera? I have not. And I tell you if I do. The only thing I would tell you is um, I have taught a few traders that work for um, a gentleman that I mentioned before who is on the Merck board um, who parcels out money. And, and they trade, for example, um, the U.S. stock market against the European stock market. Hey, buddy. One second. Yes. Yes, that's fine. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done before you, John. I thought you just popped in. Okay. So, um, where was I? Oh. Let me read. Okay. So, um, they look at European stock market, the U.S. stock market. One day one is leading, one day the other is leading. And they assume, they make this assumption. And it works pretty darn good, by the way. I don't trade it, but I watch them, and I, and I taught them how to use this methodology in their pairs trading. And, you know, it works pretty darn good. Don't fight it. If one is leading, it's probably going to continue to lead. Don't fight it. So that's the only thing I've ever seen. Um, let's see. Save the voice, my brother. How are you doing, Tomas? I will ever see. And my voice does sound terrible today, but I'm okay. When a new swing high is confirmed, move in the opposite direction. Price often starts to turn and come back in direction to establish the swing to check it out if I could be broken. I mean, is this the kind of main theme in a market, checking previous confirmed highs? Yes, absolutely. So what you want is you want price to make wide range low. It'll pull back because it's out of energy. Then when it comes back down, you don't want it to take out that extreme. And that will help you start to put together a tactical plan. If your analysis this is from Becky, how are you, Becky? That Scott will leave the British on. <laughs> I don't have any analysis that says that. And uh, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm a mutt. I'm half Eastern European and half Scottish Irish, and um, I, I manage money for the Queen, a big, big amount of money for the Queen. And I'm like her. I don't know if you heard her comment yesterday. Um, I am. She said that she's she's the ruler of Scotland and Britain, and uh, their people should decide what to do. So I, that works for me. Becky says the Jewish holidays are coming. Would you tell us how those affect the market? Yep. Oh, I, pre I appreciate your kind words. Um, they, they affect the market this way. Um, less than before, and I don't mean this racially, however, when I first started to trade, a lot of very savvy traders, a lot of the old, old, older guys, were Jewish, or at least Eastern European. So they spoke Yiddish. And, um, you know, with all the quants coming out these days and people talking about high frequency trading and dark stuff, and it's whatever, but you don't see anywhere near as as many of, in the younger crowd, or maybe it's hard to tell. I don't know. But I can tell you in the older days, and I'm talking about the 70s and very early 80s, the markets would get much more, either much more quiet or much more volatile during the Jewish holidays. Now, not so much, but we have a lot of people from all over the world because of the Internet and place. Listen, interactive brokers, I can remember when interactive brokers wasn't a spot on the radar, and then I remember them coming out of nowhere and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And one thing I'll have to say, I can think of three or four times when I thought, you know, Mr. King Flies, you're making a big mistake here, and I can remember eating my words every time. So brokers like interactive Brokers have brought quality execution to everybody at every level. I mean, even my guys, my graybeards, clear through them. Okay, so because they, you all have good access to the internet and to trading, we have more and more people trading. So the pool um, really runs the gamut of of everybody. That's why we have people. I don't know. The last seminar we had 47 countries. We always get 35, 45, 50 countries. Um, participating in these. Um, Mary says it's okay. I'll do better next time with a, with a drawing. Thank you, Mary. First day for IPO is the best. Well, I'll tell you what. It's part of my language. It's damn fun. 
Um, if you know how to, if you treat it like a gap bar, that's how we treat it. I'm not going to go too deep in it today. Um, and I've, I've got a hint. Um, that's all I've got. So I'll just leave it there um, that we may be able to do stock things eventually. But um, in the evening with the master and even some of the midday stuff at our market map sessions, we've done some magnificent IPO trading. And uh, like I said, we are all over Alibaba. And I will, I will give you a disclaimer. My fund is already a major holder, um, so along with Mr. Monaco. Um, but I think that's going to be a lot of fun to trade. I think it's the uh, 15th, the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, I, I know Dr. Dr. Messea. Um, okay. That's all I'm going to say. They'll vote no, I think. Okay, Tomas, I think. Um, I don't really think I know. Tons of thanks, Tim. Great. That was a good time. Okay. I appreciate it, Tomas. Um, I know you're very busy. Lend your new book ready. Can't wait to get out. I've been working hard at it except for last night. My tax attorney called me and said, this doesn't add up with this. Would you please redo this section so I had to take last night off? But I'm trying to get it out. And um, hopefully uh, a couple of sessions from now, Cynthia will be saying, hey, there's a new book. And all IB clients get this nice discount. I've got a question. Just sit there. I'm out of voice, I think. Uh, well, I was hearing your voice, and let's give it a rest right now because we're going to do this again next month, second yeah. Thursday. Um, so we'll be back with you to be able to um, more interesting information as well as answer a lot of your questions. So I want to thank you, Tim. This has been terrific. Each event, um, you just lay out everything so easy to understand, and it's uh, very helpful. So thank you very much. I also want to thank the CME Group because it's their dedication to trading, tr training traders that makes these events possible. So I appreciate their help. And most of all, I appreciate your attendance here today. So thanks, everyone, for taking time out of your busy schedule but to join us today. Now, I will be ending the event here in just a moment, and I want you to know that we've been recording this entire session. So those of you who may have had some audio difficulties or um, uh, want to come back and review the information, simply watch your email later on this afternoon, and you'll get that direct link for the recorded playback. By the way, we also make them downloadable. So if it's something that you'd prefer to watch and replay, um, you can simply download it and come back and revisit the sessions anytime that's um, convenient for you. So we are going to conclude our event today. And by the way, as you exit the session, watch for a new browser window to open up with all of these slides on it. So thanks, everyone. And a special thanks to Tim for um, taking time out of your schedule to for all of these presentations. It is terrific. So we are going to conclude our event today. You can all exit the session using the X in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And please remember to trade smart. So thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for seeing me. Cynthia, I'll see you. Well, you're, I'm going to be here with you in a week about the next time. And you'll be hearing from me very soon. So <laughs> we'll be in touch. And everyone, it's always Please watch the Interactive Brokers website, that education menu. As soon as we get the session um, material locked down, we'll have it posted out there and available for you. So thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Take care.